Well, if you're like me, you don't like your plans being interrupted or changed in any way. Um, last Sunday, uh, Jan and I left Sunday afternoon to, to go to Salt Lake. She had a treatment on Monday morning. And uh, when we got to Salt Lake, and it was pretty late, we got there around 1030 at night and went to the hotel. And she had fallen asleep in the car. And uh, we got there, I couldn't get her out of the car. I thought, well, she's asleep. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Uh, don't ever tell her I slapped her, but uh, I was trying to wake her up. And, and she wouldn't wake up. And what I didn't realize was that she was sort of in a semi-comatose state. And um, so... I've got the dog on a leash. Now, this is funny now, but then it was not. I just want you to know. And I'm trying to get her out of the car, and I think, if I just get her stood up, I can get her into the hotel, because I've already checked in, and get her into the room, and she can sleep. And so I, I start pulling her out of the car, and I get her stood up, and her legs give out. And she's just dead weight. And so now I can't get her back up, and I can't get her back in the car. And I got the dog. And, 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 and I don't know what to do, because she's just dead weight. And I'm, I'm holding on to her, and I'm trying to push her back in the car, get her back in the car, and I don't know what to do. So I grab my phone, dog in one hand, my knees against Jan, trying to keep her from falling onto the pavement, and, you know, keep her in the car. And I call my daughter, so maybe she and my son-in-law can come and help me get her into the hotel room. Well, she doesn't answer the phone. She turns off her phone when she goes to bed. All things. Why would people do that? You know, I don't know. And so the only thing I knew to do was call 911. And so they come, and they tell me, no, she's more than just asleep. She's comatose, and we need to get her to the ER. And so they put her in the ambulance, and, they're, and I'm following, and... I knew things were not as good as I thought they would be when we're about two-thirds of the way to the hospital and they turn on the siren and the, and the lights and they speed off into the distance. And so I get to the hospital and, you know, you have to wait. You have to wait and you have to wait. And then they let you go in and see her. And they're talking about intubation. They're talking about defibrillation. And so I'm in a pretty big panic there because this is not what we planned. These plans are changed. As it turns out, on Friday we had seen the doctor and he had said, now I want you to start increasing her medicines. Bump it up to here and then by Sunday bump it up to here. Well, what happened was that she had a reaction to that bumping up of the medicine that uh, created, they said that the medicine was fighting against her body. Um, she's much, much better, but she's still in the hospital. They are observing her as they start putting the medicine back in. And so uh, thank you all for your prayers. We felt them all week long. But when your plans get messed up, it just kind of throws everything into a kilter, doesn't it? Can you imagine that first Christmas, how things got changed so radically? I mean, nobody had planned for the events that happened at Christmas. Um, nobody had planned for it. This was something that was totally unexpected. 
And in fact, when that first Christmas happened, it messed up everybody's plans. It messed up King Herod's plans because he was, you know, he wanted to be the only king of the Jews. And here is this Messiah coming. And uh, that was something that totally unexpected. And so it messed up his plans. <clears throat> it messed up the plans of the shepherds. All they wanted to do was just spend a quiet evening around the campfire with the sheep. It messed up the religious leaders' plans because they were looking for a Messiah who was going to be a political or military leader who would free them from the oppression of Rome. And here comes Jesus along saying things like, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, love your enemies. And they're saying, wait, Jesus. That's not what we're expecting. It messed up the wise men's plans because they didn't plan to take an extended trip to the West. But of all the people involved in that first Christmas, think about how it changed the plans of Mary and Joseph. I mean, Mary and Joseph were a young couple. Mary was just barely a teenager. And uh, they were planning to get married and settle down and raise little Marys and little Josephs. But suddenly their whole world has changed. I mean, right in the middle of their wedding preparation, right in the middle of their engagement, <clears throat> suddenly God comes along and says, you know, I'm changing the plan a little bit for your life. And, um, you know, the angel says to Mary, Mary, three things are going to happen. You're going to get pregnant before your wedding day. Second, the father is not going to be Joseph. And third, by the way, the child's going to be God. The thing about changing your plan, that messed it up just a little bit because that's not what they were expecting to happen. So why does the second Advent candle call the Bethlehem candle? Why does it have the theme of faith in it? I think because faith was absolutely necessary for Mary and for Joseph, as they placed their, their trust in God's plan instead of their own plan. I mean, the truth is, folks, when God messes up your plans, faith usually is the only anchor you have to hold on to because your plans have been changed. <clears throat> so let me ask the question, has God ever messed up your plans? Now, I know that I mess up my plans sometimes by wrong decisions that I make, okay? Uh, that, that happens frequently. But there are times when God comes in and he messes up your plans. Now, I'm thinking back in 2003, uh, Jan and I preached in view of a call at a large church in Anchorage, Alaska. And, you know, the pulpit committee and everybody was excited. We were going to go up there and we were going to pastor. And they were saying, okay, here's a map of how you're going to drive from Georgia to, to Alaska. And it was going to be really great and all this kind of thing. And um, when the vote took place, we missed it by two votes. God messed up our plans. Come to find out the chairman of the search committee had to take his wife to the ER that morning and they didn't get to vote. I'd see God's hand in that. Um, some of you had your plans messed up this last year by something called the merger. You know? Um, I, I read about a woman in New York City who um, took her son to see Santa Claus at a department store only to find out that the Santa Claus was her ex-husband who was arrears in child support. Uh, he hadn't planned on seeing his ex-wife but within three hours, she had a court injunction slapped on him. Uh, it didn't go as he planned at, at, at all. <clears throat> you know, he wasn't saying ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, or anything like that at that point. The point is that plans don't always go like, like we set them forth, you know. Now, what I'm saying, I'm not saying is that everything that happens, God causes. That it's part of God's plan. I mean, that's not true. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because God is not the author of evil. Um, you know, if someone gets raped, God didn't plan that. Somebody gets abused or somebody has cancer. Um, the Bible says that God is not the author of evil. Uh, that's why we pray for God's will to be done, because God's will is not always done. I, I can choose not to do God's will. The fact is, 
our plans get messed up for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they get messed up because of our stupidity. Okay? Sometimes, and we are all aware of this, that other people can mess up our plans. But sometimes, God providentially and God sovereignly intervenes and he changes our plans. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's obviously what happened 2,000 plus years ago on that first Christmas. Now, in this story uh, of that first Christmas, we're going to answer some really important questions. Uh, what do you do when God messes up your plans? Or uh, those situations that suddenly seem to be out of control. When God messes up your plans, what do you do? Three things. We need to remember these three things. First of all, we need to remember that God is trying to get our attention. When God messes up our plans, he's trying to get our attention. Look in your notes there or here on the screen at Luke chapter 1 beginning at verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that was Mary's cousin, uh, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. So those were their plans. They were going to get married, okay? God, however, has something different in mind. Look at verse 31. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Folks, when God messes up our plans, he may very well be trying to get our attention. I mean, in Mary and Joseph's case, the plan was so fantastic, so unbelievable, so one-of-a-kind-in-history kind of event that he had to use supernatural means to get their attention. I mean, they would have not believed it any other way. I mean, uh, here's an angel who says, you know, this is what's going to happen. You're, you're going to be, Joseph, you're going to be the father of the Son of God. I, God, am coming to earth, and I'm going to become human, and I'm going to split history into A.D. and B.C. It's a huge event. Wouldn't it be neat if sometimes God could just send an angel to talk to us so we'd know it was from God? But folks, we don't need an angel. Because God speaks to us frequently through his word and through the impressions that the Holy Spirit puts in our hearts. Um, and God just says sometimes, I want you to listen to me. The problem is that most of us, now let's say all of us, because that's who it really is. All of us have spiritual ADD. I mean, we don't hear God. We, we have him on call waiting. Uh, we're, we're so busy. We're listening to the radio, listening to the television, listening to other people talk, listening to ourselves for that matter, that we don't have time to listen to God. We, we got our heads buried in our smartphones and God can't get our attention. So sometimes God has to rearrange our plans and say, wake up, pay attention to what I'm trying to do in your life. The psalmist said this in Psalm 81, beginning at verse 8. Oh, Israel, if you would only listen to me. Any of your parents ever say that to your kids? If you would only listen to me. Why, does, why, you know, why is that always the case that God sometimes has to change everything in our life to get us to pay attention? Uh, and why does God even want us to give attention to him? Primarily because it will spare us a lot of pain in our life. Um, we get ourselves into trouble when we want to do things our way and not God's way. The proverb, uh, Proverbs 16 verse 25 says, There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. You know, a lot of things that um, in life look to be right, we think this is the way we should go. In the end, it's a dead end. It's, it's a disaster. I mean, have you ever had some major decisions in life and say, man, this is guaranteed. This is going to be surefire success. And then when you make the decision and you get involved in it, it's an, you know, you know a, a disaster. It, it's tragedy. It's a huge failure. 
We've all had plans that just didn't go like we wanted them to. And why? Because you and I don't know the future. You and I don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know how it's going to turn out, even in spite of our plans. That's why God sometimes says, I want you to listen to me. God does know the future. He can see the problems ahead. He can see the troubles. He can see the, the roadblocks that we're going to end up uh, encountering. And uh, if you would just listen to him, we could avoid a lot of pain and turmoil in our life. You know, in the Bible, there are many times that God says, if you will do these kinds of things, you'll be successful. You'll find joy in your life. You'll, you'll be satisfied. You'll find meaning. Life will be easier. But then he'll say, but if you do these other things, it's going to cause misery and guilt and resentment and broken relationships and anger and worry. So when God tells us what to do, and what not to do, it's not because he's some kind of big ogre or some kind of cosmic cop that's trying to steal our joy from us. It's because he loves us. It's like a mother who tells a child, don't touch the hot stove. She doesn't say that because she's a tyrant. She says it because she loves the child. And God says to us, I want you to give, I want you to give me your attention. I can make life easier for you. There's a way that seems right, but it's going to end in disaster. Don't go that way. If you listen to me, I will help you out. So sometimes he messes up our circumstances, our plans, to get us to pay attention to him. <clears throat> but he does more than that. When God messes up your plans, sometimes he's saying, I've got a better plan for your life. I've got a better plan. <coughs> You know, you've heard me say repeatedly as your pastor that God has a unique purpose for every one of our lives. God made you for a reason. He made you for a purpose. And he designed you unique, uh, uniquely. He has a, a reason why you're here on this earth. And part of your life is to figure out what is God's purpose for what I'm doing. Jeremiah 29 verse 11, a very familiar passage, says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and hope. I want you right there in your notes. Circle the words good and the words future and the word hope. God says my plans for your life are good. And a lot of people think, you know what, if I turn my life over to God, then he's going to make my life miserable. There's not going to be any fun, no parties, uh, it's just going to be disaster, total boredom. You know, I got to become Amish or something. Uh, you know, he's going to really mess my life up. God is saying, no, you don't understand. I made you to love you. I designed you for a purpose, for, the, for, for a purpose on this earth. So let's talk for a moment. Let me tell you three things about God's plan for your life. Three things. First of all, God's plan for your life is always bigger than your plans. Because he has a bigger perspective. He's got a bigger perspective. I mean, when you see life, uh, you see it from your perspective. But what God sees is something even more. He, he wants so much more for our life. Now look at Mary and Joseph. They just wanted to get married and settle down and be a nice, happy couple. God says, no, I want to bless the whole world through you. If you don't get anything else I say... Understand this, God made you for a purpose, and you have no idea what God wants to work through you, how much he could do in your life and through your life if you are totally committed to his plan for your life rather than your little plans, your dreams, your ambitions, uh, your goals that you've set. If you and I would just say, God, I am totally available to you, use me. That's what Mary and Joseph did. Look, listen to Mary's response. Luke 1 verse 38. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. If you and I would only say, God, I am totally available for you to use any way you choose, you and I would be blown away by what God could do in and through our life if we were totally sold out and surrendered to him, because his plan is always bigger. The second thing about God's plan for your life is it's harder than your plan. 
I mean, that's why so many people cut out on God. Uh, human nature is always to take the easy way out, to just slide through on stuff, to, to uh, take the course of least resistance. But God says, I'm not saying it's going to be easy to follow my plan. In fact, it's going to be harder than your plan. And why is that so? Because God is more interested in your character than in your, in your comfort. Uh, he wants you to grow up. He wants you to mature. He, he wants you to be a person of character and integrity and taking responsibility in life. God's not going to take the problems out of your life. Um, it's always going to be a harder way because it's producing character. If God removed all the, the problems out of your life, you'd be a spoiled brat. You wouldn't be worth living with, okay? I mean, if you got everything that you wanted in life, you would be worthless. So God says, yeah, it's going to be harder. I mean, when Mary and Joseph said, okay, Lord, we're going to cooperate with your plans. Use us. Do you think it was easy? Absolutely not. It wasn't easy for Mary to say, okay, I'm going to be an unwed mother. Can you imagine the gossip that went around Nazareth? In those months that followed that angel's announcement to her. Um, who's going to believe her story? It's God. Can you imagine what she went through? Um, and then think about it. At the end of her pregnancy, maybe, you know, a week or so before uh, she's to give birth to that, to that boy. Uh, at the time when ladies, when most of you just want to lay down, <laughs> you know. She has to get on a donkey. And ride for, for several days from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Talk about uncomfortable. Guys, you and I don't know what that's all about. But these ladies do. They're all nodding their head. Okay. You understand what she was going through. And then when she got there. And was about ready to deliver that first child. Her first child. She didn't have mother. She didn't have grandmother. She didn't have the comforts of her home. She was delivering a baby in a strange town in a stable. And I can imagine at times that, that Mary said, God, I don't understand what you're doing. If this is the Son of God, why is he not being born in a palace with all the comforts that, that could be afforded a king? Um, I'm delivering him, him in a stable without any kind of help. See, God's plans are always harder and they're always bigger than our plans. And finally, God's plan for your life is also more rewarding. It's more rewarding. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. See, when, when you cooperate with God's plan and God's purpose for your life, you have two benefits that come from that. You have significance and you have satisfaction. Those are two things that people the world over are looking for. Um, and nothing can replace those significance and, and satisfaction. You know, not sex, not status, not success. Significance and satisfaction. I mean, once you discover God's plan for your life and you start carrying out his plan for your life, man, you're going to say, oh, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. This brings meaning to my life. I found my niche. I've, I've found my purpose. I'm not just here you know, taking up space and sucking up oxygen and wasting resources. I have a purpose for my life. How do you know when you're not living according to God's plan? Well, three characteristics. There's fatigue, there's frustration, and there's fear or worry. You're fatigued all the time. You're frustrated all the time. You're worrying all the time about everything happening. Why? Because you're following your plan and not God's plan for your life. And you know, the payoff for, for carrying out God's plan is enormous. So the Bible teaches that life is preparation for eternity. And so you've got 50, 60, 70, 80, maybe 90 years here on this, this earth. But when we die, you're going to spend far more time in eternity than you are in this, this short period of time in, in your life. You're going to spend forever in eternity. So what are you supposed to do while you're here on this earth? For those 50, 60, 70, 80 years or whatever. What are you supposed to be doing? Well, God says, I want you to do three things. First of all, I want you to get to know me. 
I want you to get to know me, not just know about me. He says, I want you to have a relationship with me, a personal, intimate relationship, where it's more than just a head knowledge about God, but it's a heart relationship with God. And second, I want you to know and to discover and to fulfill your purpose on this earth, the purpose that I made you for, because you are put here for a unique purpose. And the third thing, I want you to develop your talents and your skills and, and allow me to build your character. Why does God want to build our character? Folks, that's the only thing you're going to take with you to heaven, is your character. Can you imagine going before God and not being prepared? You know, this past year, uh, there are a lot of well-known people who died. I just kind of went through a list on the internet of people who died this last year, and there was, you know, people that were well-known. I mean, lots of people died, but well-known people. I mean, people like Doris Day and Tim Conway, uh, fashion icon Gloria Vanderbilt, uh, comedian Rip Torn, uh, author Toni Morrison, musician Eddie Money, football legends like Pat Sum uh, uh, Summerall and Bart Starr, actress Valerie Harper, um, NPR's Cokie Roberts, the journalist, um, Peter Mayhew. Anybody know who Peter Mayhew was? I eat Chewbacca, Star Wars. Okay, yeah. Uh, actors Luke Perry, Peter Fonda. Uh, a lot of well-known people died this last year. Jeffrey Epstein, okay? You know, okay? Some people die young and some people die old. But folks, everybody dies eventually. And isn't it odd that you would spend your entire life and never prepare for what you know is eventually going to happen to you? That you're going to die. Jesus said, I came at Christmas time to make sure that you're ready for when you die, when you stand before God. Can you imagine going before God and, <clears throat> and, and God says, you know, I'm going to ask you two questions. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Uh, did you accept him as your savior? Did you get to know him? Did you, did you, uh, even, did you put your faith in him? And then... Did you get to know what my purpose was? Did you start carrying out the purpose that I put you on that earth for? And can you imagine standing before God and saying, God, I know it sounds kind of funny, but um, I was just too busy. I mean, I knew about Jesus. I knew about you. But never in my entire life did I take the time to develop a relationship with you and get to know you. I, and I was just so busy. I had my purpose and my plans that, that I wanted to do. And I know you had a purpose and a plan for my life, but I just kind of figured that my plans were better for my life than your plans. God's going to say, what were you thinking? Uh, you know, do, do you think I put you on this earth just to do your own thing? To, to never get to know me and to figure out why you're here on this earth? God's going to say, wrong answer. You see, it's more than just being embarrassed. This has eternal implications. That's why Christmas is so important. Because God says, I want you to know me. And he says, but I know that you're not going to get to know me unless I come down to earth so that you can see me and hear me. So that I can know you in hopes that one day you will know me. <laughs> That's why the third thing God says when I mess up your plans, I'm not only saying, listen to me, not only am I saying, I've got a, a better idea, but I'm also saying, I want you to learn to trust me. I want you to learn to trust me. Can you imagine the faith that it took Joseph to do what he had to do? I mean, if your fiance had come to you and said, honey, um, I'm pregnant. And God's to blame, you know. Um, would you believe that story? Well, the truth is the Bible indicates that Joseph didn't believe at first. And that he planned to privately end the relationship with Mary. Look at Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 and 19. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin... She became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, 
her fiancé was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Joseph was going to call off the engagement until God sent an angel to speak to him and saying, she's right, and it's okay. Can, can you imagine the faith that Mary had to have to recognize that of all the people in the world, she was the one that God chose to be an instrument that he would use when he came into the world. God's plans, plan was so different from their plan that all they could do was trust. What else could they do? They had to trust God. But you know what? That's okay. Because the Bible tells us that Trust is the only way that we can be pleasing to God. It's, it's not by religion. It's not by rituals. It's not by a bunch of ceremonies. It's not by a bunch of regulations that we seek to follow. In the Bible, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that the only way to please God is through faith. It says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. See, God wants you and I to learn to trust him. And every time God messes up your plans, folks, it's a test. It's a test. Am I going to trust God or am I going to trust me? Do I think I know better or do I think God knows better? Am, am I thinking that, that I know what's going to make me happy or am I going to trust that God really knows what's going to make me happy? See, it's a test. This Christmas, um, you may be feeling a little discouraged. It's kind of a year when discouragement time of year when, when discouragement just kind of crops up. Uh, things haven't gone like you planned them to. You had so many great plans and suddenly they're not happening the way you want them to. Um, maybe you came here this morning feeling just a little bit lonely. Holidays have a way of doing that, of making us feel lonely. Um, you may be feeling stressed out about the whole situation that's going on in your life, or, or the month of December. December is the most stressful month of the entire year. Did you know that? Studies have shown this is the most stressful time of year because, you know, oh, I got to clean the house. I got company coming. The family's coming back. I've got presents to buy, all those kind of things. It's why I wait until the very last day to buy my presents because the stores only have men in them. It's a manly kind of thing, okay? You know, it's a brotherhood, all right? Uh, for some of you, it's going to be the first Christmas since the divorce. Or it's going to be the first Christmas since you lost that loved one. And it hurts. I know it does. For some of you, this is going to be the first Christmas that you're going to face with... Uh, some kind of disability or some kind of illness that looks like you're going to be with the rest of your life. <clears throat> if the truth were known, some of you are a little bit nervous about 2020 because you're uncertain. You don't know if you're going to have a job or not. You don't know if your relationship is going to hold together or if your marriage is going to blow up or if your kids are going to make it through. Um, you've got all sorts of concerns and you just don't know. You're just worried. I mean, the fact is you don't know, and, and, and you have no idea what the future holds. You call all the psychic hotlines you want to call, but you're not going to have a clear, certain picture of what 2020 is going to be like, because it's God's secret. Um, you don't know what 2020 is going to hold, but you can know three things about this, this coming year. God is still going to have a personal plan for your life, and you may have missed it, for the last 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. But folks, you can get in on it today. You, you can start today and make the rest of your life the best of your life. Second thing, you can know that God is never going to leave you, but that he will be with you every single step in 2020. And the third thing that you can know is you can know that ultimately the only legitimate, rational way to live is to figure out who God is and to get to know him and to start carrying out his purpose for your life and living for him in the future. And, and folks, if you're not living for God's purpose in your life, then what are you doing with your life? You're, you're certainly not living. You're just existing. So what do you do when your life doesn't make sense? 
you focus on God. Don't focus on others. Don't focus on yourself. Focus on God. Uh, God spoke these words in the Bible. We looked at them last week. Let's listen to them again. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. God wants you to be a seeker. Uh, <clears throat> remember those first wise men? They were seekers. They weren't believers. They weren't Christians. They were seekers. They were truth discoverers. And some of you are like that. Maybe you haven't yet dis made that, you've turned your life over to Jesus Christ, but you're checking it out. You're on the road. You're, you're, you're making progress. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I want to say congratulations. Keep seeking. Keep looking. Because we all start out as seekers. But the truth of the matter is there needs to come a point when you become a believer. When you step across the line. Or you're going to miss the whole point of life. So what is it you're seeking? What is it you're searching for? You know, we can get below all those surface issues of, uh, you know, I'm seeking happiness, I'm seeking success, I'm looking for freedom, I'm looking for, you know, good relationships. And what you really need is a relationship with God. Because He's wired you that way. You have a God-shaped hole in your heart that only God can fill. And if you don't fill it with God, if you try to fill it with, you know, possessions or anything like that, uh, it's not going to work. It's like trying to put a square peg in a, in a round hole. It doesn't fit and you know it. And what happens, it's frustrating. And I don't care what your background is. We, we have a church filled with people from a lot of different backgrounds. You may be, have come from a Catholic background. You may come from a Baptist background. You may have come from a Mormon background or, or a Jewish background or whatever. <clears throat> but I'm not talking about religion here. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ where you're not trying to earn your way to heaven. You're just depending on God's grace and His grace alone. We're all here this morning for different reasons. Everybody's got a reason to be here. Some of you were dragged here by your spouse. Some of you came because you wanted to see a friend or, or, or whatever. We've all got these different reasons why we're here. But what I want you to know is you're not here by accident this morning. A thousand years ago, God knew that you were going to be on December the 8th, 2018, or 2019, that you were going to be in Calvary Baptist Church at the 1030 service. And he has a reason for you to be here. He wants you to slow down long enough so that he can get your attention and he can say to you, I made you for a purpose. I love you. And you matter to me. And even though, you know, you've gone off on your own, you've fo followed your own plan, and you thought that was going to bring meaning and purpose to your life, I want you to get back on my plan. I, I've watched you every step of the way. I saw your first heartbeat in the womb. And I know all the good and the bad and the ugly in your life. And what I want you to know is I still love you. I still love you because I'm God. Um, that's what he's saying to you. And he's saying, I could never love you more than I do right now. And I could never lo love you less than what I do right now, regardless of what you've done or what you will do. <clears throat> because my love for you is not based on your performance. It's based on the fact that I made you. And that I care about you. And I know everything about you. And I want you to come and to get to know me personally. So, this Christmas season... I want to invite you to switch from your own plan to God's plan. Switch from saying, God, you know what? I'm in charge of my life and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And instead, switch to Jesus Christ. To say, Jesus, I want to give my life to you, my heart to you. I want to do things your way. Because I recognize that it's a better plan than my plan. I want to start in 2020 making the rest of my life the best of my life through a relationship with you. See, God wants all of us to learn to trust him. And, and we're talking about faith here, uh, placing our faith in God, even when he changes our plan. Uh, faith is following God's instructions, even when they don't make sense, even, even when they don't seem logical or rational. 
Faith is being obedient to God. The writer of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord. That is, put your faith in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding. Make God's way the primary way, not your own way. You know, every person here is on maybe one of three tracks in this journey we call life. For some of you here, you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You've put your faith, your trust, your hope in Him, your confidence in Him. And you're doing as best you know how to live out God's purpose for your life. To those of you, I would say, let this Christmas be a Christmas of celebration. Celebrating the three things that God has done for you. He's taking care of your past. He's taking care of your present. He's taking care of your future. I mean, think about it. In the past, he has forgiven you and removed every sin from your life, every disobedience. He's given you freedom in Christ. In the present, he's giving you his power to handle the hassles and the troubles of life and to give you joy and victory in all that you're facing. And in the future, he's got that secure as well. Eternal life with him in heaven. <clears throat> so some of you are right there. So others of you are seekers. You haven't quite accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. You're still checking it out. And I would say to you, congratulations. Keep on checking it out. And at some point, I'm praying that you're going to step across the line and you're going to say, hey, today, today is the day when I'm going to embrace Jesus Christ as my Savior, as my Lord. And then there's a third group of you, some who, uh, you know Christ as Savior, but you have been walking so far away from him that he's almost like a distant cousin. You just don't know him like you ought to. And you've just kind of wandered away, and for some reason you're here this morning. It's not by accident. And what God wants to say to you this morning, hey, this is Christmas time. Come home. Come home. I'm not going to beat you over the head. I'm not going to scold you. I'm going to wrap my arms around you and say, welcome home, prodigal. Which one of those are you? This morning would be a great time to take that next step. Accepting Christ as Savior, returning back with a new commitment and a fresh approach to following Jesus Christ. Whatever God would have you to do, that's the next thing you need to do. And you know in your heart of hearts where you need to be. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and it would be an opportunity for those of you who need to take that next step of, of moving from being a seeker to being a, a saved believer. It would be a great step to take to say, I'm going to make Jesus the Savior of my life. For others of you, this would be a great opportunity to just come in a moment and shake my hand and saying, hey, pray for me. I want a fresh start with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Let's bow for prayer. <laughs> as I pray this prayer, if you need to know Christ as Lord and Savior, you need to step across that line. Would you let this prayer be your prayer? Just pray it in the quietness of your own heart. And words aren't important. What's important is the attitude that you bring to it. To simply say, dear God, thank you for being patient with me. I've always known you were there, but I've really not gotten to know you very well. And I thank you that you brought me here today. I, I'm not here by accident. I, I've known that there's something missing in my life. I just didn't know it was you. So thank you for seeking me even when I ignored you. Today I, I realize you've been trying to get my attention. And I admit that I've been focused on um, my plan, my life, not yours. And I realize that you have made me for a purpose. And so today I want to take the very first step in getting to know you, Jesus Christ. Today, Jesus, as much as I know how, I want to open my life to you. Replace my guilt with your forgiveness. Replace my confusion with your peace. And would you please replace my uncertainty about the future 
and and my death with your gift of eternal life this next year i want to pay attention to you god and i want to discover and i want to fulfill the purpose that you've made me for i want to cooperate with your plan for my life and i want to learn to trust you more in jesus name amen we're going to stand and sing a great hymn i surrender all that's a great statement to say to jesus christ this christmas season that i am surrendering everything that i am to you for you to use for your plans for your purpose if you if you've prayed that prayer and trusted jesus christ lord and savior come and tell me i'd like to know about that if i can pray with you further about the decision that you're wrestling with in your life please come and let me pray with you. We're going to sing. I'll be down here at the front. Come and let me pray with you and speak to you.